So let's, let's pray and expect God to bless us tonight. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it's good to be here tonight. Thank you that we can be. Thank you for the Sabbath and for Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. I pray if any of us are fatigued or lethargic, it's been a big week after all, that you'd help us to just be alive in this moment. And I pray earnestly that you'd be merciful to me. You know, Lord, when any speaker stands to speak, no matter who that individual is, that person must be attended by your spirit. And you know that's my great need. You have said that the Holy Spirit wakes, awaits our demand and our acceptance. And so I'm asking, believing, let your spirit light me up and connect me with your throne. And at the same time, let your spirit awaken us, give us a keen focus, bless us, and grow us in this moment. Let your word do its work. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I was the brightest kid in my primary school four kids in our primary school. Okay, that's not true. It was a large enough primary school, but I was the brightest kid in my primary school. Went to high school. They put me in 3-2. I was in Form 3, and there were six classes in the third form, and I was in 3-2. And they, they tried an experiment this year. What they had done uh, hitherto was they taken the bright kids and and spread them out over the six classes. But this year, they decided that they'd take a a whole gaggle of the bright kids and drop them in the same class together, hoping that we would spur each other on. (laughs) Didn't quite work out that way. I don't think they tried that experiment again. We were just bad for each other. So by the time we got to the fifth form, um, I wasn't nearly the student that I had once been. In New Zealand at that time, in the fifth form, you sat your school C or your school certificate, and based on your marks, you went into the sixth form, or you repeated uh, what would be the tenth grade. Now, keep in mind, I'd been the brightest kid in my primary school, third form class, I held my own. Somewhere I kind of fell off the rails and started majoring in rugby and lunch eating and phys ed and not much else. And so the school C exams began. 
And remember, this was make or break. I remember the, f- the first exam was always English, and I sat down in, I think it was the music room where the exam was being held, and I looked at this English paper. It was the first one, first, and I thought, oh, my goodness. I've been attending school for 10 years now, and it's all come to this. And I'm about to, I'm about to flame out dismally. I wish I hadn't wasted my time. Anyway, made it through the English exam. I think they gave points for writing your name in the appropriate place and for spelling it correctly. And later on, I discovered that I had passed English, and I should have because after all, I speak it. You'd think that would give you an advantage. But I don't speak science. Science was a horse of a different color. And I looked at that science paper and found religion, began praying. (laughs) I was just a bad student in science. It didn't interest me. Wally, our teacher, Mr. Sergeant, but we called him Wally. A bit of a weirdo as it turned out, but um, Wally was, I think, a good teacher, but some of us can't be helped even by good teachers. And I looked at that science paper and I just realized, man, I'd wasted some time. But funny enough, funny enough, there's something I remember from science. It's the periodic table of elements. I just remember it, at least not not all of it. I mean, there's like 70,000 names, or 70 or something, names on that list. But do you remember the first element in the periodic table of elements? What was it? Hydrogen, that's right. What's second? Then, lithium, then, beryllium. We've got some scientists here. Or some very bad students with good memories. <laughs> Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon. What, what? Nitrogen, oxygen, f- fluorine, and then, then neon. Neon's number 10. What's 11. I don't know. You don't know either by the sound of it. What's, what's number 55 on the periodic table of elements? Yeah, that'd be funny, wouldn't it? Number 55 is something called cesium. And if you were to look at the periodic table of elements, you would find cesium left-hand side down a little way. After all, it's number 55. As a metal... Cesium is soft and a silvery gold color. It has a melting point of 28 degrees, which is a little bit unusual. Now, here's what's peculiar about cesium. I did not learn this in science, of course, but I learned this later, and now I find it rather interesting. What's interesting about cesium is it has one electron on its outer shell. What do you call that shell? What's the name of that shell? Ah, I'm glad you came. The valence shell. You learned something tonight. The valence shell. Who knew? Science teacher. Wally would laugh. Cesium has one electron on its valence shell. And that one electron just longs to make the jump to another atom that lacks a full outer shell of electrons. I'll repeat that for you so you get it. Cesium has one electron on its outer shell. And when a cesium atom comes close to another atom that has one electron too few, the cesium atom wants to make the jump. So it's a bit of a problem child. So if you would get a cesium atom near, let us say, oxygen, or fluorine, or iodine, or bromine, or chlorine, that one electron on the valence shell of the cesium atom is going to jump. And when it connects with the oxygen atom, or whatever other atom that might be, there is a boom. There is some excitement. 
There is movement. A difference is made. This thing causes action. Now, why does it do it? The, 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 the cesium atom isn't looking to make trouble. It's not spoiling for a fight. It's not saying to itself, it's such a nice quiet day. I need to go and disturb the day for somebody. Let's see how loud a noise we can make. That's not what the cesium atom is thinking. The cesium atom doesn't just ambush other atoms or properties randomly. It doesn't do that. You see, what happens is there's the cesium atom there and the oxygen atom there and the cesium atom just does it. It can't help itself. It's what it does because that's what its nature is. It is a reactive thing or maybe a proactive. We'll let the English teachers figure out the right word to use there, but it's an active thing. Stuff happens. It just can't help itself. It's kind of on autopilot. Because of what it is, it does what it does. Put the cesium atom in the right environment, or the wrong environment, depending on how you want to put it, and something's going to happen. Not because the cesium atom says, I must make something happen but because the cesium atom is what it is. And because it is what it is, it acts a certain way. I have this conviction. And I believe that through the Spirit of God, God would have us be like that cesium atom, brought into the right circumstances or the right situation. Something's going to happen. Not because we have to work ourselves up into a lava, but simply because we are what we are. We can't help ourselves. Put us in the right place and something's going to happen because we have been touched by God. And because God's Spirit rests upon us, we can act no differently. I'd like to take you in your Bible first to 1 Samuel Chapter 14, let's turn there. God's looking for Christian believers who would be like the cesium atom. Can't do anything about it. Ya what ya? Because Christ has touched you. And as a result, something powerful happens through you. And so let's have a look here. Did I say 1 Samuel? I did, did I not? 1 Samuel and chapter 14, and we're going to begin at the beginning. 1 Samuel 14 and verse 1. We'll read the story. We'll run back through it once we're done. Verse 1 says, It came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that's on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. Verse 2, Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And Ahiah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. And between the passages, come on, see if you can get this in your mind's eye. Between the passages, by which Jonathan sought to go over unto the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side. The name of the one was Bozes, the name of the other Sene, the forefront of the one was situated northward over against Michmash, the other southward over against Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Now, background here, the king had rashly offered a sacrifice that he was not authorized to offer, too impatient to wait for the man of God to arrive. Samuel did arrive, but on Samuel's timetable, not Saul's. And with 36,000 chariots arrayed against Israel, with 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore for multitude, that's a lot of people. Saul is informed by Samuel that his kingdom 
will not continue. Upon which communication, the prophet leaves the king to his own devices. Saul does a head count. He has 600 men with him against 36,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people more numerous than the sand of the seashore. Things are not looking good. Israel was disheartened and dispersed, dispersed, diminished and dismayed. No longer in any way were they the masters of their own destiny. The text says there were no smiths in all of Israel. If you wanted something sharpened, you had to go to the Philistines to get it sharpened. The Bible says there was no sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. So let's understand this. Only Saul and Jonathan possessed a weapon. Two armed men, 598 unarmed men against 36,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore for multitude. You can hardly get a more disconsolate bunch than that. But there's an old saying, it says, cometh the hour, cometh the man. These were desperate times and they called for decisive action. So, so where is the man? Where is the man? The king should have been the man, but the king was starting to come unhinged. And rather than choosing to do something, he made the cowardly decision to do nothing. And chapter 14, where we read, finds our man sitting under the shade of a pomegranate tree. Far from taking the lead, this brother is taking the back seat, hoping that the problem will somehow just go away. But it wasn't going to. And this is when the Holy Spirit is striving. It is very often when things look like hardly anything is happening. It's often when things look the most hopeless that the Spirit of God is getting ready to do something spectacular. Our job as Christians, job, uh, you choose the right word, our role, our thing, our place as Christians, is simply to work in harmony with the working of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to invent a revival, but participate in what God is doing. It's, it's pretty simple, really. Get with the Holy Spirit. I grew up 40 minutes from one of the best left-handed breaks on the planet. Yet I never surfed. I, 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 in New Zealand, you cannot get more than 70 miles from the sea. But as a kid, I didn't really like the sea. I liked being there, but I didn't like being in there because you never know what's under there. So at Daytona Beach in Florida, where the water is pretty well always warm, and the waves keep on coming in, a friend of mine, actually the wife of a friend, decided that she was going to teach me to surf. She was, is Hawaiian and was actually born surfing, as funny as that seems. And so she decided that she would give me some basic lessons as to how to surf. You know, the hardest thing in the world I found was actually just getting on the board. They wobble. I, I mean, something terrible. I said to her, what will happen should I actually stand up? She said, if you stand up, all you got to do is catch the wave. What if I miss the wave? She said, don't worry, there'll be another one along. I reflected upon that. You know, I thought, yes, that's how it is with working with God. All we have to do is catch the wave. That's all. God's spirit is working. God's spirit is striving. We don't have to beat God so that the spirit will work. We don't have to uh, uh, convince God to work. This is, this is our father's world. He's working here. And when we want to get involved with God, all we really need to do is catch the wave. God is at work. It's not difficult simply to cooperate with what God is doing. But here back in 1 Samuel chapter 14, we have a church that has lost sight of its mission. Instead of the head, this mob was the tail. The situation called for something. Actually, more accurately, it called for someone. That someone could have been Saul, should have been Saul, but in the absence of decisive leadership, the Spirit of God called on the son of the king. Let me pause there and just take a little risk. You must not complain about your leadership. I lived in this country 25 years ago, and I remember it was a time when people, it seemed everywhere, were complaining about the leadership. 
Man, it's tough to be in. Don't complain about it. Well, if you're going to complain about the leadership, covenant to pray for the leadership more than you complain about the leadership. And then I think we'll see uh, miracles happen. But if you're disappointed or disheartened by what you see on the local level or, or on the conference level, or the union level, or the division level, or the GC level, instead of complaining about it, do something about it. Instead of belly aching about the pastor not doing enough or the elders not being worth their salt or the president of this or that not being up to your high standards, then just go out and be the difference that you wish those individuals were. The church can never get so bad that you can't work for Jesus. This is the wonderful thing about being a Christian. You don't have to ask for permission from anybody to share your faith. You don't have to get a vote from anyone to make a difference in your community. You have been commissioned by God. I'm not telling you that I, I, I share the view that the leadership is in bad shape. I'm simply saying I've heard a lot of that in my time. But if you don't like what you see, just go and do what you wish you were seeing. God has given you permission to do that. And we actually see an example of this here. The king should have been out leading the charge, but he was not. So his son stood up and went. The spirit rested upon the son of the king. And God did not raise up an army, at least not right away. Instead, he called on one man, just one, because God knows something about the power of one. Now, what did Jonathan do? He did something radical. He did, he did something outrageous, something which under normal circumstances would have been doomed to fail. Now, if Jonathan had gone to the board, the church board, and requested their authorization for the mission that he was on, he would have been told that he was on a fool's errand doomed to fail. If he had applied to the conference for a budget for this campaign, he would have been told that what he was about to do was too high risk. The likelihood of him actually baptizing anyone was pretty low, we won't give you any money for this, at least not this year, maybe another year. And a lesser individual would have complied with that, would have. A lesser individual. A lesser individual than Jonathan would have said, you know, that's right, this mission is just too risky. But impelled by the Spirit of the living God, Jonathan could not capitulate. He would not relinquish. He did not shrink from facing up to the burden of, the Lord had placed on his heart. God had spoken and he heard the voice of God saying, Jonathan, there is no limit to the usefulness of one who by putting self aside makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. What Lord? Me against all of them? No limit. But wait, 36,000 chariots and a multitude of soldiers against 600 of us and only two of us have got a real weapon. No limit. I could die out there and then what use would I be? No limit. All alone? No limit to the usefulness of one, God said. All right, he replied, I shall go. And with the boldness of Elijah standing before King Ahab, or the boldness of Daniel before Darius. Jonathan set his face like flint and accompanied by his armor bearer went up to engage the ferocity of a garrison of Philistine soldiers. They work out a plan ahead of time. And depending on how things pan out, we'll know for sure whether God is with us or not. And if we can be confident that God is with us, Jonathan said, then we will go confidently on and we will take care of business. Friends, I wonder if Jonathan hasn't just worked it out here. I wonder if this isn't a lesson for us. I believe it is. It's key in serving Christ. Maybe the thing we simply need to know is this. Is God with us? And if God is with us, maybe, maybe that's all you need to know. If God is with you, then you can go about your God-ordained business in confidence that he which hath begun a good work in you is faithful to perform it until the day of Christ. Maybe that's all we need to know. I remember as a church pastor, and let me say this, by the way, I believe, did I say this? If I did, I'll repeat it gladly. In ministry, you cannot rise higher than being a local church pastor. You cannot. Maybe a Bible worker. That's kind of like being a pastor, but without the board meetings. So maybe that's that. But pastor is where it's at. After that, 
It's demoted. Now, we need fabulous people in leadership positions, but we have to cause them to suffer the indignity of being demoted from being a church pastor before uh, they can assume those positions of responsibility. Now, I'm going to pretend that Elder uh, Pastor Harker is not here tonight because he used to be a union president. And I'm going to tell you uh, a, a little, I don't know, we'll, I'll try it out. And you can tell me just how true this is. Someone said to me one day, why is it that a union president never looks out the window in the morning? And I said, I don't know why is that. The man said, because then he wouldn't have anything to do in the afternoon. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, who, you know who told me that? Elder Dan Jackson, division president. He'd been a union president. So I'm just sharing that little story. I mean, no disrespect, not much, not, not much anyway. But I just want to say, I believe in the role of the church pastor. I'm thankful for our leaders. And I believe that in this church, God has given us wonderful leaders. But I believe that the highest you can rise in ministry is pastoring at the local level. It's a blessing, a wonderful blessing. So I was I was pastoring at the local level before I was demoted. And, uh, and, and, and this project came to the church board. And it, it, was, it, was a, it was a kind of a bold, sort of a soul-winning initiative. And the project was floated, and it was interesting to sit back and watch the dynamics. There was going to be some cost involved. For some, the be-all and the end-all was, where's the money coming from? Fair question. Others were saying, no, 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 we tried something like this before. And if you remember, it wasn't nearly as successful as we wanted it to be. And so we need to be certain that this will be successful. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's not too many certainties like that in ministry. And others simply wanted to know if God was leading. Is God leading us in this? Some were shrinking back, but others were saying, let's go forward and God will open the way. And God will provide the funding. Let's go. Friend, I want to tell you tonight, if God calls you to get out of the boat, then he will give you the ability to walk on water. If he has called you, that's true. If God calls you to perform a giant task, you are going to have his blessing even when it's just you and when all you're holding in your hand is a leather strap and five smooth stones. God will lead you. Jesus might say, what I want you to do is walk around a city once a day for six days. On the seventh day, walk around seven times. Shout, and the walls will come tumbling down. And you might say, man, that does not sound very likely to me. But if God is with you, God will bring success. If God leads you to scone to go knock on doors, then go knowing that God is with you. If God leads you to a small church in the countryside or up your street or to share with your friend or your neighbor on the bus or at work or at university or at high school or wherever you are, if God is with you, his blessing will attend you. You know what I believe? I believe that the people in God's church want to share their faith. I believe that. We know we should. We love Jesus. We want to, but we're ill-equipped. At least we feel we are. We feel inadequate. We're scared. I go to churches, I say, why is it that more people don't share their faith? Always the same answers. Because we feel like we don't know enough. Because we are worried that people won't accept what we have to say. All the time people say these things. But if God is with you, you can go forward in the spirit of Christ and do your work. Run your ministry. Share your faith. Do your outreach. Work your project large or small. Is God with you? God has been with this church since its inception. He's not going to abandon us now. This thing, this church, I believe in this church. I, 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 I've read what the Bible says about it, and I've read what we have an inspired counsel. And I know that weak and enfeebled though it is, the church is the one object upon this earth upon which Christ bestows in a special sense his what? supreme regard the church is the apple of his eye the bride of christ this is god's church he's with it no matter how bad something looks to you 
He's with it. You read in the book of Revelation and we read about the seven candlesticks representing the churches. And where is Jesus? He's in the midst of the candlesticks. If you're looking for a perfect church, good luck with that. It isn't perfect. How do I know? Because you're in it. That's how I know. It's not perfect. And you can say the same to me. And I'll say, amen. But if you're looking for God's church, if you're looking for a church with God's message, if you're looking for the church that Jesus is in the midst of, we are in the right place. He is taking this church on to victory. He wants to use us as part of that victory. What a privilege. And when God prods you to share your faith with somebody, I have a brother, he can't help himself. He loves to share his faith. He was living in Sydney. He was taking the bus to work. Before he got on the bus, he prayed, Lord, is somebody on this bus for me to share my faith with? Gotta be. He got on the bus. He sat down next to a lady. Good morning. And she said something like, <laughs> And he said, well, not her. Not her. The next day he prayed his prayer, got on the bus, saw that lady, went past and sat down next to somebody else. Good morning. How you doing? He prayed before he got on the bus every day. Got on the bus, sat down next to a young man. How you doing? Great. How are you? What's your name? My name is. Oh, where you from? Where you going? See you tomorrow. Okay. My brother prayed to God. Shh, there's something there, Lord. I believe there's a Show me the path to this man's heart. You know, when he sat next to the guy and said, hey, how are you? And the guy said, oh, I'm great. He didn't whip out his great controversy. He said, I read this. He didn't do that. Not that there'd be anything wrong with that. It was the great controversy that won me to Jesus. When a man said good morning, he didn't say, ah, let me tell you about the Pope. He didn't do that. <laughs> There's a time and a place for sharing everything, but it's not usually right away. Not usually. You know, when a man said good morning, he didn't say, do you keep the true Bible seventh day, holy Sabbath day, or are you worshiping the sun every week? He didn't say that. Some of us say, hi, how you doing? Great. Boom. Mm. Mm. Praise the Lord. Shared my faith. Guy is bleeding on the ground. Bruised. Yeah. Share a mission report on Sabbath about how you did. God is with this church. There's no question. And he's with you. And I believe that we want to share our faith. We do. But we're a little scared and we feel a little inadequate and we're not sure all the time. Now, we have some faith-sharing champions among us. Thank the Lord. And my brother's one of these people who, he doesn't feel any more bold than anybody else, but he, he loves God and wants to share his faith. This guy spoke to him. So every morning he's getting on the bus, he's praying and he's sitting with the guy and they're getting like a house on fire. And he still hasn't found the right the right moment, you know. Now, sometimes you can't wait for right. I understand that. But my brother knew that every day they were going to be on that bus, so he was waiting for the right moment. One morning, the fellow says to him, man, I saw this great TV program last night. You did. Tell me more. He said, it was about the, the universe and the galaxies and the, the sun and the moon and the stars and all of these things. It was magnificent. I loved it. My brother said, did you ever think about who made all that? That's all, just a question. And the young man said, yes, I have. I've wondered about that. A Bible study was born. They became fast friends, had Christmas dinner together. Before long, that man had studied his way right through the message of the Bible of the Adventist church. Because my brother, before he got on a bus, prayed, Lord, there's somebody here. Show me that somebody bring someone to me if we pray that prayer if we would pray for divine appointments imagine no really imagine if everybody came down to the tent at 6 30 in the morning and begged god to pour out his spirit no just imagine i'll tell you what happened in vanuatu in vanuatu they planned way in advance for a major evangelistic series in port vila i heard the uh was it the event. I heard someone give a report on this firsthand. They prayed way in advance. You know what the church members did? The church members got together every morning at half past five 
to pray for God to move in that evangelistic sequence. Now, you wouldn't do that. But they did at the church. Now, they weren't doing the 777 thing, pray for seven minutes at home on your own. Nothing wrong with that. They were coming out to pray together at 5.30 in the morning. And they were pleading with God to pour out his spirit. And when that series of meetings was over, they had baptized 1% of the population of the country. Now, I understand, and so do you, that there's not a massive amount of people in that country. But still, 1% of the population had a baptism planned on Sabbath. They ran out of daylight, and there were still scads of people waiting to be baptized. They said, come back tomorrow, come back Sunday, we'll have a baptism then. And so people came back to be baptized. And then they had strangers showing up. Wait, we don't know you. You weren't at the meetings. No, no. We watched the meetings live on Hope Channel. We believe everything. You said baptism, join the church. We want to be part of that. Will you baptize us? Baptize 2,500 people. Now, you're going to tell me, oh, that's the islands. Oh, that's the islands. You know, that is such a defeatist mentality. Someone's walking the streets of Scone and overnight comes up with 20 Bible studies. That's Pentecostal. It's colossal. There's no church there. We have no established presence. We don't have a hospital. We don't have schools. We don't have a community service center. This is magnificent. And God will do great things, even in postmodern, jaded, secular Australia. Of course he will. Will it be just the same? I don't know. You know, they baptized 50,000 people in Peru in one day, not without hard work. And I'll talk more about that tomorrow morning. I I don't know if we're going to see that. Maybe. I understand the cultures are different. I understand that. But we can see here, uh, appropriate to our uh, culture, what we're seeing in other places appropriate to their culture. We just can. Because there's no limit to the usefulness of one. No limit. When Jesus says, let's take this ship and go to the other side of the lake, it shouldn't matter to you if a ferocious gale whips up and tosses you about. Jesus said, we are going to the other side of the lake. If he wants to take you on history's first submarine ride in order to get you there, then let him do so. Jesus said to those fellows in that boat, oh, ye of little faith. And haven't you wondered about that? Jesus was asleep. They're bailing water out. They're in jeopardy, according to the Bible. They think they're going to drown. And Jesus says, you all don't have any faith. Huh? Jesus, are you missing something here? No, no, he wasn't missing anything. Because he said, let's go to the other side of the lake. So where were they going? Other side of the lake. They weren't going to sink. They were going to the other side of the lake. When God is with us in this thing, we can be confident. We have a great message to share, a wonderful Savior to share. We have life to share with dying people. We don't need to be dull. We can be like the cesium atom. Boom, a reaction. Wherever you go, you're making a difference. Wherever you go, you're bringing light. We are to be the salt of the earth. Salt makes a difference. Ever get any on your tongue? You say, hmm, there's a difference. Ever get any in your eyes? Oh, there's a real difference. Salt makes a difference best not to get in somebody's eyes but we are called to be the salt of the earth the light of the world light makes a difference just flip the switch and we'll see right now what an enormous difference a little bit of light makes and God says you can be light you don't have to try hard just be the light now I want to challenge you don't be those kind of Christians well 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 my ministry is just to be a Christian And so wherever I go, I take that little influence and people can see my life. I mean, yes, yes, but more than that. We are to be fishers of men. You don't sit on the boat and hold out your shiny new fishing rod and say, oh, fish, look what I've got. I'm a good fisherman. No, there's a hook, man, and, and bait. And you've got to be smart about where you fish and what time of day you fish. We've got to get this out of our head that, well, my ministry is just to be a Christian and hope people ask. They won't ask. There are people here whose neighbors see them drive, to, drive out the gate every Saturday morning. And they don't know where you go. And they've been watching you do it for seven years. 
and they don't know. So your example has just left them buffaloed. They haven't got a clue. We need to add to our example words and literature and kind offers to help and tell them, man, I saw this awesome television program on. Did you hear about it? It's called It Is Written. Let me tell you where you can see it. When you do that, uh, people forward junk to you on the internet all the time, on email. You, you, you don't forward something to somebody. Say, I saw this sermon. Shh, watch this. I saw a presenter. Uh, I, here's something my church is doing. Add a little something to that very passive example that you're giving people. We can be like cesium, boom, wherever we go, not blowing things apart, but making a positive difference. Jonathan was moved by divine impulse to go and make a difference. One man, just well, one man and his armor bearer. They left the camp secretly in case somebody would oppose them leaving because they were determined, determined God is going to make a difference through us. They were determined. Jonathan now is stealing towards the Philistine fortress creeping forward under the warmth of the sun, likely without the benefit of that gentle breeze because they were 30 or so miles away from the Mediterranean, five miles from the Dead Sea. His nerves might have been calm, but I believe he could hear his heartbeat pounding in his chest. He was going up to fight against a, a squad of Philistine tough guys. And this is when he says something to his attendant that ought to ring in our hearts. And bless us as we prepare our communities for the coming of Christ. He said in verse 6, and we read it already, it may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Oh, that we would remember those words. God doesn't need an army to win a battle. All he needs is one man, one woman. Sometimes it can be a child who makes the difference. And even then, he doesn't require that that one man or that one woman fight a battle for which they're ill-equipped. You have read where the Bible says, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. That's Exodus 14, 14. God gave Israel the victory over 185,000 Assyrian soldiers without even firing a shot. All God's people needed to do was to be willing and trusting and prepared to depend on God and believe in his power to do what the people themselves could not do. In your spiritual walk, you don't have to be the strongest or the brightest or the most talented or the best prepared. You just don't. Because as we've said already this week, the Bible says God's strength is made perfect in weakness. And so all we do is bring God, not our ability, but our availability and see God do remarkable things. Two men approaching a Philistine stronghold Philistines are surprised that Jonathan would come near them at all. By the time Jonathan and his armor bearer come near, or by the time they're done, the carcasses of 20 dead Philistines are littering the area. The Philistines are plunged in a confusion. The Bible says there was ultimately, and you love the language, a very great discomfiture. The Philistines were routed, not because God sent a marauding army into the theater of battle, but simply because there is no limit to the usefulness of one. If there's no limit, brother and sister, we can aim higher. We can pray bigger prayers. You know, I, I love that the conference president says, we are gonna reach this conference, the whole place. I love it. Now, it, it's, it's a statement of fact because the Bible says that that's going to happen. But I, I remember what somebody once saying, the key is to bite off more than you can chew and then chew like mad. Because with God, you can't ever really bite off more than you can chew. We ought to pray big prayers. <clears throat> what are you doing praying some little prayer that your neighbor's gonna come to faith in God? Pray for your neighbor on one side, your neighbor on the other, and the people up and down your street. Pray for your whole town. Oh, come on, John, the whole town not gonna come to faith in Christ. Okay, then it won't. If that's the way you want it, it won't but pray that it will anyway. Pray bigger, pray more. 25,000, are you listening, pastor? Pray more. Expect great things of God. Big, do you remember that story where the, the, the king goes to see the prophet and the prophet says, pound on the ground. Remember that one? And he hit the ground, do you remember how many times? Three times, boom, boom, boom. 
the prophet was angry. He said, you hit the ground three times. That means God is going to give you three victories. You should have pounded the ground nonstop. Then God would have wiped out all of your enemies. You see, God was upset that the man didn't make greater demands upon God. Are you following me? You wouldn't go to Bill Gates and say, oh, Bill Gates, can I have 20 cents? What would you do that for? He'd think you're crazy. God wants us to pray big prayers. I don't mean stupid prayers. Big prayers. Prayers of faith. Stretch a little bit here. Your church hasn't grown. This is, this is one of the things that just bugs me. Your church hasn't grown. I mean, the vast majority of churches. They haven't grown since you've been attending. So when did your church ever just get together and have a little prayer? God, please grow our church. And then pray again. Hey, God, would you grow our church? Father in heaven, we are appealing to you to grow this church. You know what's going to happen next? Somebody's going to have a bright idea. Someone's going to walk in through the door. Somebody's going to begin a ministry. Money is going to come. Why? Because you are praying. You're praying knowing that prayer is the key in the hand of faith that unlocks heaven's storehouse. You're praying bigger prayers now. Maybe you're just praying prayers now. Pray and keep praying. Oh, but pastor, you don't understand. We're in a hard area. Oh, you know, that's right. Unlike everybody else who's in a real easy area where people are just beating down our doors, demanding that we baptize them. Oh, yes, not one of those churches. Oh, you don't understand. Uh, uh, it's a little town. Oh, great. That's not too many people to have to go and work at. Uh, a lady told me, this lady was an Aussie living in United States. She said, we had four people in our church. We were all old. We realized that a couple of funerals from now, there was going to be no more church. She said, we didn't know what to do. We didn't have a whole lot of money. We didn't have any expertise. We hadn't had any training. We decided to pray. And we got together and prayed that God would grow the church. And so they prayed. Nothing happened. Well, they kept on praying. And they prayed, they, they prayed a while. And suddenly, the lady is, is pushing the shopping cart around the supermarket. And someone comes up and says, hey, you're a Christian, aren't you? Yes, I am. Oh, I'm so glad because I really have been looking for somebody who would help me to understand the Bible. And I wonder if you would study the Bible with me. And she's like, well, I didn't, I, sure, I'll study. I don't know how to give a Bible study, but okay, we'll study the Bible. And people are coming up, aren't you a Seventh-day Adventist? Yes, I am. I've always wanted to know what Seventh-day Adventists believe. They, they had a slew of Bible studies taking place. They weren't expert Bible study givers, but they were willing and they had prayed, Lord, will you grow this church? Evidently, God heard their prayer. Fancy that. And he started to grow their church. They realized, oh, we have a problem. We didn't think this through. Because now we've got people who are ready to be baptized, and uh, we don't have a baptistry. So they, they got online, and they went to baptistries are us, and they ordered a baptistry. <laughs> this guy drives a 1,000 miles or more to deliver the baptistry. He gets there, and he says, what is this thing anyway? They said, oh, it's a baptistry. What in the world is that? Well, they explained to him, baptized? Why in the world would people be baptized? Well, this is what people do who know God and love God. Do you know anything about God? No, nothing at all. Would you like to know something about God? Sure, I would. They started Bible studies with the man from a distance. And just a few months later, that man drove a thousand miles again. This time he drove to the church where the baptistry had been installed so he could be baptized in that baptistry that he delivered. Amen. And how did that begin? Because four people said, Lord, please, would you grow our church? Why aren't we praying those prayers every single solitary day? God, bring somebody to me. Be like my sister-in-law who prayed, God, bring somebody to me and make it easy. That's all. Make it easy. I'm shy. Make it easy. So she had a, a, a bunch of literature in the, in the van and she and my mother-in-law were out doing some stuff in town one day and while they were parked on the side of the street, a man walked right up to their vehicle and tapped on the window. And he didn't look like a bad egg and so they pressed the button and down, yes. He said, you know, I don't, I don't know why, but I just feel impressed to come over to the car and give you my business card. And they said, oh, thank you very much for this. We know why. Yeah, we feel impressed. And they started sharing. And oh, he was grateful to receive it. Now, do we know what happened? Oh, I don't know. That's not the point. We share, sow the seed. God will water it. We can, we 
can afford to pray big prayers, we really can. And expect that God would do big things. As the believer, you are in the driver's seat when it comes to your relationship with God. You have the assurance given by God and penned by the Apostle Paul that he who has begun a good work and you will perform it. That's the promise of God. There's a promise. You don't have to bring much of anything to God except your will. And if you will give your will to God, then there is no limit to the usefulness of one who by putting self aside makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart or her heart and lives a life wholly consecrated by God. Now we got to put self aside. That's not easy. Hardest battle ever fought was the battle against self. But we can ask for God's help and tell him, Lord, I trip over my own feet, but I'm willing. Would you please take my will and make it yours? And God will. He will do this. There is no limit to the usefulness of one. God called one man, Abraham, and the promise was sure. He raised up one man, Noah, and humanity was spared. He used one man, Daniel, and Nebuchadnezzar became the Bible's perhaps most unlikely convert. God fortified one prisoner, Joseph, and his people were prospered. He raised up one woman, a woman of courage named Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Did God use her? Ask Sisera, he of the splitting headache. God placed his hand upon one woman, a wise woman, the Bible says, of Abel and Beth Maacar, and Sheba, the son of Bichri, lost his head. Jesus spoke with one woman at a well, and an entire city came to Jesus. At the same time, it took just one angel, Lucifer, and all that God had created was jeopardized. It took just one dissenting voice in the wilderness. Before long, the ten outnumbered the two, and as a result, Israel spent 40 extra years in the wilderness. It took one disciple, one kiss, one unconverted heart, and the Savior hung on an old rugged cross. Friend, all it takes is one act, just one, one act. We had a series of meetings. A, a lady came to the meeting. She should have been baptized. She made a decision. I'll be baptized. Her family didn't like the decision. And before she was about to drive to the church to be baptized, her and her son, they took her car keys and wouldn't give them to her. She didn't have money to call a taxi. It was a long drive. She turned up that night. She looked sheepish. She had questions. She didn't have questions yesterday. Now she has questions. Man. Anyhow, we loved her. We prayed for her and prayed with her. And then uh, our next series of meetings was not far away. And she had a sister who lived in that town. On the final night of the meetings, she showed up at the church. She'd been visiting her sister. She just showed up. And I did not know that. And I'm up the front and uh, finishing off the sermon and out there Angela walks in and my wife who is a shy sort of retiring kind saw Angela Angela how are you oh, I'm just fine well what are you doing Angela well, you know I got all these questions I got a list of questions a list this long <laughs> pulls out the questions my wife says Angela really huh? really you have questions well Angela why don't you just get baptized there's a baptistry in there right now we know you love God you were on your way to be baptized. Questions? Those, those aren't real questions, Angela. Those are excuses. How about you put those aside and be baptized tonight? <laughs> she was uh, unusually forthright. And Angela said, well, I'm up the front, you know. I got to the end of the sermon and, and while I'm up there, the, the, the pastor comes up. He says, well, thank you. This has been wonderful. But John... There's something very special we're going to do tonight. Oh, watch that. Then the door opened and I looked out and here's Angela and her son Isaac walking in wearing baptismal robes. And the pastor said, we'd like you to baptize them. Unbelievable. The dad who was key in keeping the keys from her, it wasn't long and he was going off on mission trips. The sister was baptized. The brother-in-law was coming to church. Why? It wasn't because of my preaching. It was because one shy woman just said, Angela, would you make a decision for Jesus? Nothing told her she had to say that other than the voice of the Holy Spirit. And she made that decision. I knew a fellow named um, 
what was his name? We'll call him Joe, shall we? And I met this guy, shared his story with me. He said, my life bottomed out. I made a decision I would kill myself. He was driving to the place where he was going to kill himself. And he stopped for gas, petrol. I mean, of course, every, every dead man needs to leave a pickup truck full of gasoline, right? What did he stop for? But he stopped for petrol. He filled up his vehicle. He was walking back from the, sh- from the inside, from having paid for the petrol. And he was walking across the forecourt. He got to within about six feet of his car. And a voice called out, Joe. He turned around and it was someone he barely knew. Joe, it's good to see you. What you doing? (laughs) Not much. Not much. He said, what are you doing Tuesday nights? And Joe said, right now I don't expect to be doing anything. Why do you ask? I'm having a Bible study in my home. I just wonder if you'd like to come. Sure, I'll come. Great, thanks, see you then. Joe got in his truck, looked down at his gun, turned the car around and drove home. His truck, turned the truck around and went home. He said, maybe maybe this is God. Maybe there's a reason to live. When I met Joe, he'd been the pathfinder leader in his church for 16 years. He was training to be a lay evangelist. He'd been sharing his faith all those years with anyone who would listen. Simply because somebody spoke up. Imagine if the man hadn't followed the promptings of the Holy Spirit and called out to Joe. How about all those times you've thought, imagine what might have happened. Souls won, families changed, communities impacted, families saved. Who knows? Who knows? There's no limit to the usefulness of one. No limit. No limit to the usefulness of one who by putting self aside makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. We have been called to be his and to be used by him. No one too small, too old, too ignorant, too inadequate. We have all been called by God. You know, I I, I know I should finish here, but I I want to tell on myself and then hopefully share another story that might be useful. I was home in New Zealand. I was with my son. We're walking down the street. We bumped into a guy. We got talking. And uh, I said to the guy, where are you from? He said, I'm from Morrinsville, east of Hamilton. I said, Morrinsville? Huh. I know Morrinsville. You do? Yes. I said, I'm from Uh Morrinsville, I said, that's where Dwayne Monkley is from. Dwayne Monkley was a fantastic rugby player who was never selected for the All Blacks. Should have been. Was never, he was like the, the, one of the best ever players never to make the national rugby team of New Zealand. And I played against him in high school, and it was like a boy, a, a, a man among boys. He was a fantastic player. And I said, yeah, Dwayne, Mon- yes, that's right, Dwayne Monkley, sure, yep, he's a Morrinsville boy. I said, I played rugby against Dwayne Monkley. Did you? When? I said, in high school at Morrinsville. I remember the game vividly. played rugby against Monkley. He said, did you really? Yes, yes, played for Narrowway High School, first 15. He said, well, if you played against Dwayne Monkley, you had to have played against me. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah, because I played with Monkley every, we were in high school. I played, no kidding, what position did you play? He said, I was the number eight. I said, I was the number eight too. We marked each other on the rugby field. Probably had a fight with each other knowing me. Probably. <laughs> he probably won. Uh, how about that? What are the chances? What a coincidence. Very interesting. As we were walking along, he then told an off-color joke to my son. A little bit crude. 
Not the worst thing anyone had ever said. I don't even think my son understood it, but still. Oh man, I felt uncomfortable about that. 30 years before, 30 years, that, that's a long time. He and I had played against each other on the same rugby field. But he wounded my little sensibilities. And after that joke, all I want to do was protect my son's precious little ears and get him out of there as quickly as I could. So we get to the um, intersection. He's going this way. We're going that way. I can't get out of there fast enough. Uh, we, we, we cross the street. I guess he's going that way, so he waits. We cross the street. Or he crosses the street, somebody like that. And I said, mate, good seeing you. Mate, see you later. He said, yeah, mate, good seeing you. God bless you. God bless you. Now, where I'm from in Chattanooga, Tennessee, even an atheist will say, God bless you. It's just part of the culture, if you know what I mean. In New Zealand, you don't say that, not to a stranger, unless you are a fully paid up, card-carrying Christian. This guy was a believer. And I didn't even take the time to share my faith. Well, you might say, well, John, he's a believer. He doesn't need it. Wait a minute. He's a believer, but not a believer in the three angels' messages. He needed it. Anyone, anyone would need it. But what I'm saying is already there was common ground. The hard work had been done. All I needed to say was when he said, oh, so what do you do for a living? All I needed to do was say to the guy, i got a television program. And here in New Zealand, you can watch it. You get First Light TV. He would have said, sure, I get, it's everywhere. I get First Light. Excellent. Channel 26. Look out for us. And if I'm not on there, just keep watching. And I'll be, I'd love for you to see my TV program and see what I do. Would you do that? That would have been the easiest thing in the world. I didn't even do that. All I could think of was, let's get away from this guy. He might say something inappropriate again. Wait a minute. If he's saying inappropriate stuff, that's the guy who needs to hear about Christ. He needs something. And then I come to find out he's a believer. Okay, he's a believer who tells off-color jokes, but he's a believer. And so it would have been just easy to have a conversation with him about God. What was I thinking? The truth of the matter is I wasn't thinking. I didn't put self aside. All I was thinking about was me and my boy and our precious little eardrums instead of having a burden for that man's soul. That's all I was thinking. There is no limit to the usefulness of one. Imagine what would happen, and one day it will, if God's people just said, that's it, I'm making myself available to God. When you get to Revelation chapter 18, the Bible says that there was a fourth angel and he came down from heaven. It's, 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 it's an amazing passage. And it says, the earth was lightened with his glory. And you know, if we can just cut through that very quickly, what this is telling us is that there is coming a time when the whole world will be lit up with a manifestation of the character of God in his people. The world will be illuminated with the glory of God through us. These are people who just said, God, use me. And he uses them, us, to such an extent that this darkened world is set ablaze with the brilliance of the character of Jesus. We believe Jesus is coming back soon. Amen. So sooner than that, this is going to happen. And God is asking us tonight if we are content to just sit on the sidelines and watch the game being played, or if we want to be out on the field doing something to advance the cause and to grow God's kingdom. He'll use anybody as long as you're willing. There is no limit. I wonder tonight if we can say to God, we're willing to be used. We're willing to be put to work. We're willing to make a difference, to support this church, to do whatever we can to grow this church and invite people to know the Christ of this church. In so doing, we will hasten the coming of Christ according to the word of God. And we will grow and be blessed like we've never been blessed before. Let's pray tonight. I think we ought to pray. 
our Father in heaven. Tonight, we thank you for opportunities you bring to us to share Jesus with others. Help us to be awake to them. We thank you for an illustration, a story from the Bible about someone who was, who was willing to be used by you. He went on an impossible errand and brought salvation to your people Israel. Lord, what might we do if we were willing to go on your errands? We are willing, frankly, but we're a little scared sometimes. We don't like to be rejected. We don't want to be found not knowing enough. Thank you, Lord, that you've given all of us an experience, a testimony, a witness, and that you can use us just as we are, just where we are. Bless our families. Some of us here, we have burdens for our children or grandchildren, our brothers and sisters, our parents. Lord, call our families to, to, to yourself. We're burdened for our churches. Some of our churches seem to be stuck in the mud, stagnant, not growing. Maybe we, we have wonderful churches. We like them, but we want to see them grow, Lord. We do. You've got to help us to reach our community for heaven. You've got to help us. Friend, tonight, are you willing to ask Christ to put you to work, to use you somehow, big, small, doesn't even matter? But would you say to God, I'm willing, use me. If you would, raise your hand, please. Don't be one of these cynics, oh, I don't need to raise my hand. Raise your hand. There's something powerful in it. If you don't want to be used by God, keep your hand down, please. But if you would be prepared to say, Lord, use me somehow, somehow, raise your hand. Father, thank you. Already in this place, there are many who are being used by you wonderfully. But so many of us are not being used and we are missing out and we're stealing from you. So use us, would you? Bless us, grow us, bless others through us. And Lord, would you arrange it that soon we would see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. We thank you tonight. We love you. Thank you for the Sabbath. Bless us in it. And we pray gratefully in the name of Jesus Christ. Please say, amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. See you tomorrow morning.